don't know how popular the book is. I'm hoping it will be popular. But here goes. The book has possibly what is the longest title ever. The full name of the book is The Bad Boy's Guide to the Good Indian Girl or The Good Indian Girl's Guide to Living, Loving and Having Fun. The title is so long that it doesn't fit on the first page. So it runs all around the back and the front of the book. Um, so this book is co-authored. It's not just my book. It's written by me and another writer friend called Smriti Ravindra. The two of us have written a lot of short stories and uh, a lot of these short stories are about growing up as Indian, sort of Indian subcontinental because Smriti is half Nepali uh, girls in the Indian subcontinent. Each story is in some way linked to the other one and uh, describes some facet of growing up or coming of age and what it means to be labelled good or bad. So some of them are actually interview based where I've spoken to um, uh, 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 boys, girls, good, bad, whatever you want to call them and uh, the stories that emerged are in here. This story is called Name Games. I'm going to read half of it. Um, it's told from the perspective of this boy called Angad. Hi, my name is Angad. About gigs, gigs is short for good Indian girls. What do I say? I can only say that I've had really bad luck with them. The first time I started thinking about good girls was in high school in that small hill town where I grew up. I had just cleared my 10th boards. I never took my exam results personally, but it was clear the examiners hadn't taken a shine to me. My father was not thrilled to discover that I was in the bottom third of my class. The secondary school, the senior secondary exams decided the course of one's life, and at this rate, my life seemed headed straight into the gutter stream of the humanities. So, during summer vacation, my father made me join coaching classes for physics, chemistry, and math, four hours a day, every day. My mother took pity on me. She had me join violin classes in the evening. To help him relax and improve concentration, she told my father. The tuition center and violin classes were both sexual deserts. The violin class took two batches every evening, 4 to 5.30 p.m. for girls, 6.30 to 8 p.m. for boys. There was an hour between the two batches, so there was no question of overlap. If a boy stayed on that street long enough to see any girls, he could safely assume he was hanging around, waiting to see girls. This would be noticed by the teacher and your parents were sure to be called. So none of the boys hung around, hoping to meet girls. But fate seemed to have singled me out for a reprieve. Rita appeared in town. It was the day my bicycle broke down. To save rickshaw fare, I decided to walk to violin class. I saw a girl walking towards me, a violin case in her hand. She noticed the violin I was carrying and gave me a tiny smile. I returned her smile. I didn't take my bicycle to the repair shop the next day. I walked again. Once again, I met her walking back. She smiled again. Three days of this and my father, annoyed at my laziness and time-wasting habits, got my bicycle repaired. I had no excuse to set out early. I had to cycle to class and I didn't see the mystery girl for a week. Then one afternoon, the bicycle tire ran out of air. I was wheeling my bike along and there she was. This time, I gathered courage. Hi. It was a vague, non-committal smile. Or so I thought. What did I have to lose? The girl was an outsider. Maybe her family was just staying for the summer. My name's Angad, I said. Rita, she said. I couldn't think of anything else to say. I just stood there staring at the wheels of the bicycle. I don't think I'd even looked properly at her face. I had no idea whether I found her attractive or not. She broke the silence. So you don't come every day? I do, but it takes only 15 minutes on a cycle. Today I'm early. No more explanation was needed. She nodded. My name is Rita, she repeated. And we walked away in opposite directions. My bicycle tire was pumped up that day. I didn't dare set out early. My father was watching my time-wasting ways. I didn't see her for two weeks. Then one day, I saw her in the market. It was somebody's birthday and all the tuition center boys had taken permission from their fathers to go out. We were in an ice cream parlor when I spotted Rita with two other girls. 
I didn't say anything, but one of the other boys promptly leaned across the table. He whispered, See that girl? That one in the green suit? I know her. Her name is Rita. Another boy laughed. He didn't bother to whisper. So what? Everybody knows that. Really? Oh yes, he sniggered. Everybody in the town knows Rita. Even the Panwalas and the Rikshawalas. She talks to anyone. Tells them her name. I concentrated on my ice cream. Then one of the boys threw out a challenge. So let's see if you know her. Call her. Call out to her. We'll see how much you know her. The boy who had spoken first began to snigger. He kept sniggering as he licked his ice cream spoon. Just as Rita was about to leave the parlor with her friends, he called out, Rita! Hello! Rita swung around and began scanning faces at our table. The other boys began to laugh. Nobody said a word. They just laughed. Rita's eyes were on my face. Her friends tugged at her hands and the girls left. I wanted to say something in that ice cream parlor. I wanted to say that maybe the whole world knew her name and it was easy to know anyone's name. But did they really know her? How can anyone else really know anyone else? I talk to these boys every day. We spend four hours a day together, but I didn't know them and they didn't know me. They don't know their own mothers. I wanted to tell those boys that knowing a girl, really knowing her, was an accomplishment none of us would ever have. We were thick-headed and they were complex. We were impatient and territorial, insensitive louts. Just look at us. Assuming we could grab some piece of a person when all we had access to was the sound of her name. I wanted to tell the boys that they were all dolts and the girls were far out of their reach. We were pitiful. I wanted to say all this. But I didn't. I finished my ice cream and we all pooled our pocket money to pay the bill. I think of that day, that day even now and I feel I should have said something. I should have spoken to Rita or tried to meet her, apologize somehow. But I just didn't know how. We didn't talk to each other, girls and boys in that town. Maybe you have to understand that place, that kind of school to understand why I was so helpless. Ours was a co-ed school, but until high school, we only noticed the girls during annual day celebrations when they dressed up in saris. We played, separate, we played in separate parts of the playground. Inside classrooms, the girls sat up front in the first three or four rows. The boys took up the rest of the seats further away from the blackboard. Boys who sat just behind the girls were either academically inclined or short-sighted. Those who were keen on getting female attention sat right at the back. They occasionally let out soft, hollow-sounding whistles that echoed too loud in the whitewashed classroom. There were only three boys who sat next to the girls in the fourth row because there weren't enough girls to fill that row. One of these boys was me. Okay, I'm going to stop here. You can read the rest of the story when you pick up the book. Thank you.